Business of Architecture, episode 303. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we explore the intersection between design and enterprise, otherwise known as the business of architecture. Today, we welcome Paul McLean to the show. Designer Paul McLean is synonymous with contemporary homes with expansive views, features, and connection to the outdoors in the wealthiest parts of Los Angeles. McLean-designed homes have been purchased by people such as the Winklevoss twins of Facebook fame, fashion designer Calvin Klein, and Swedish DJ Avicii. In this episode, we dive into his story of going from a single-person practice back in 2000 to designing some of the largest and most expensive homes in Los Angeles. If you'd like a roadmap to creating a practice for yourself that has fulfilling and rewarding work, remember to get free access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. You'll also get access to my weekly tips on growing your dream practice. And with that, let's get on with the show. Hello, Paul, and welcome to the business of architecture. Thank you, Enoch. Thanks for having me. I, I got to admit, I, I'm totally excited to have you here on the show. Uh, your, your, your team sent over uh, a digital copy of the book that was recently released, Creating the Contemporary House. And I have to admit that I got sucked in. <laughs> I should hope so, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like one page after another. And so to those of our listeners who enjoy beautiful sweeping vistas of Los Angeles, uh, projects that exemplify kind of contemporary modern design. Go check that out. Paul, where could they pick up that book? Oh, a- any any good bookstore or Amazon.com or wherever. It should be easy enough to find. Yeah, and you'll find it under the title Paul McLean, I think is the title, right? And it's Creating the Contemporary House. Right. I think it's McLean Design. But there you go, McLean way, Design. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Paul, tell me, let, let's go back because behind every building and behind in every impressive body of work. Now, these, of course, are works for the, the, shall we say, the very privileged, a lot of the homes that are in the book, people that have uh, probably very large budgets, people who are very wealthy, movie stars, investment bankers, things like that. And so, obviously, there's a lot of budget that's gone into these homes. However, we know and we understand that you don't get there in a night. It's too easy to look at these projects and say, oh, wow, Paul must, you know, he's born with a silver spoon in his mouth. So I'd like to go back and just kind of <laughs> dissect that with you. Is that true? Maybe you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. I, I want to say I wish, but actually maybe I don't wish. I know I wasn't, that's for sure. Um, I grew up in very modest background in Dublin, Ireland, and I think – one of the things that I was very lucky and fortunate about was that I always wanted to be an architect since I was maybe four or five years old. So I had a direction in my life from an early age, and that obviously helps out. Well, tell me about that. So I guess from from around that age, I started drawing houses. Interestingly, I guess I've really only been interested in houses most of my life, uh, not necessarily all forms of building, but uh, I do... My mother tells me when I was four or five years old, I asked her, who's the person who draws houses uh, for a living? And I, she said, that's an architect. And I said, well, I want to be that. So I didn't have much exposure to architecture growing up. Um, I did. We had a local library, for those of you who remember the old days before the Internet. And I would go to the library and look for architecture books, but there really weren't very many. There's uh not even like books by Le Corbusier or stuff. There was there was one book though of Frank Lloyd Wright houses, which I discovered when I was around ten. And I do remember being excited about that and kind of perplexed at the same time, not quite understanding that those were houses because they're very different to what I grew up with and, and what I, I was familiar with. So, you know that that was where my journey sort of began, I think. And uh, you know, as a teenager, obviously, it was hard to contemplate the idea that architecture school is so long and that you were going to be poor for a long time. Uh, but uh, I finally got my head around it and uh, interviewed for you know one of the two architecture schools there were at the time in Ireland, and was fortunate enough to get in place. And that's where we began. And how did you end up making the transition over here to the United States? 
So I had some friends who lived in Southern California, and after I finished college, uh, I came over to visit them. I'd always been interested in Los Angeles because uh, as I went through the college process, I always became much more aware of uh, contemporary architecture and residential architecture in particular. And I, I've always felt that Los Angeles is probably you know, ground zero for residential architecture. It's, it's amazing the experimentation that went on here in the last hundred years or so. And so I was very keen to come out and see some of that and didn't really come out with any plans though. Uh, came out for the summer originally, uh, finally got a job, not, not in a coffee shop and decided I was going to stay, uh, worked for an interior design firm for a couple of years, worked for a contractor and then found a job with uh, an architect that I liked who did residential design and stayed there for four or five years before setting up McLean Design. Uh, what what time period did you come? Tell me about the years we're talking about here. When did you first arrive in Los Angeles, and when did you get that first architectural job? Mid nineties, so not long after the Northridge earthquake. In fact, I remember when we were at college, uh, some of my fellow classmates came over as well, and in the hope there might be some architectural work to do after the earthquake. Um, and then, you know, it was probably around ninety six when I got that job, and that was in Laguna Beach, California, and. You know, it was interesting as a starting point, Laguna Beach has a design review committee and I had to make presentations in front of the board and just the fact of having to do public speaking, having to get out there, having to explain ideas, negotiate was a, a tremendous learning experience, but also gave me exposure to the community and that helped me get my practice going, which started in around 2000. And how did you pick that architect to work with initially? But, Based on his work, uh, that was my what I was looking for. And it was very similar to what I had always wanted to do. And I learned a lot there. And uh, also, not just about architecture, but just about how to deal with clients and how to, how to, to work with contractors and how, how the whole business comes together. So that was really a, a great place you know, to, to learn about that. And we started our firm because... A lady came to me and she had bought a lot and she it had existing plans on it. And as she explains what she wanted to do with the house and the plans and how she wanted to redesign it, it was really obvious that the plans she had were just nothing like what she had in mind. And she and her husband were looking for a very contemporary, open house that connected to nature and the plans were for sort of a typical Mediterranean track house. So there was really not much to work with there. So... I told her that she'd be better to start off from the beginning again. And, and, you know, nothing, never heard anything for a while after that thought they maybe didn't go forward. And she called me up on new year's day in 2000 and said, it's a new millennium and we're ready to start. And we want you to design a house for us. And that was our first project. And so how did you make the transition from the firm where you're, where you're working to actually starting the design firm? Were you waiting for that product to happen and then you transition? Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's often the case with people. You need a new, you need a client. You have to start somewhere. And for me and my wife, we were like, well, if we're going to go back to Europe, uh, which was our original plan, then it would be great to have the experience of designing a house from scratch and seeing it through. It would be a tremendous way to kind of improve my own architectural background and so we just said okay as soon as that happened started a little bit in the evenings for a couple of months and transitioned out of the office and then hung up our shingle and how did you get the second project word of mouth and that's where the advantage of working in a small town with with uh public exposure comes in so uh, people had seen me around town. I had to present my project at the, the local community and people were then aware that I was there. And, you know, it's amazing, especially, I think, one of the things I really love about America and California in particular is how open people are to supporting young architects or young people in general. Um, I think sometimes if I've been trying to set up business elsewhere, people would have expected me to have designed 10 houses before they were willing to take a chance. But people were much quicker to take a chance here. They they saw a presumably something that they liked and felt that they were, I mean, when you think about it, building a house is very expensive. And so it's quite a, a challenge to take someone with relatively limited experience and, and trust them to pull that off and basically spend all their hard-earned cash. So 
Um, that's one thing I feel people are much more open about here than they are potentially in other places. But also, I, I think one of the things that helped get that going was back then, I, I was very, I was good at drawing, drawing in three dimensions. And, you know, we have to think about that in terms of what that really is. It's, it's a way of communicating ideas. And that's what you have to be able to do. You have to be able to communicate your ideas effectively to the client and to the community and to whoever else is involved so that they understand and can have confidence in his ideas. So back then, you know, which is around the year 2000, before we were dealing with 3D, you know, SketchUp and rendering programs and so on, the only way you really do that was to uh, do it by hand. Makes sense. I remember those days. And there's still probably a lot of stuff that still happens by hand. So for our audience, Laguna, of course, Laguna Beach is an affluent area. So you're already starting in an affluent area. And it's, it's no joke even back then when you started that these properties were expensive, these homes were expensive. What, how do you think that influenced your ability to then leverage that work into larger and better projects? It's interesting, but you, you, when you, particularly if you look at our book and you're seeing where we're at now, obviously it's 20 years later almost, uh, it's been a long process we started doing any work we could do uh, at the beginning. Our goal was to do contemporary residential design, but not all of it was the first five or six years. So you're building a portfolio whichever way you can and trying to get as much product out there as possible. And for me, that was something I was always aware of. It, you, you can only market one house so often. To, to, you, know, you need to get out there. You need to have product out there that's built that people can see and feel and have confidence in. So we took on a lot of work that we, we just needed to pay the bills, remodels, additions, you know, basically kitchens, cottage designs, and so on. And because we were fortunate to be working essentially at that stage in that community because everything needed uh, an architect or, or someone uh, who has experienced that way uh, to, to take the projects through the design review board. So, so that's an advantage that we had that would maybe be different to just having two or three homes that you would build. We also had the experience of going through that review process and people were concerned about that review process and, and interested in hiring someone who had experience with it. So that was obviously an advantage to have. So I think starting out, it helped to be a, in an affluent community where people could afford to hire a designer or an architect to do a house and be to be in a place where not just your architectural skills were selling your product. In those early days, Paul, what was the key to getting those products? How did you get your work? Word of mouth. It's always been word of mouth. We've never advertised uh, past clients, contractors, mainly it's, uh, contractors and past clients. And it's, uh, it continues to be that way, though we often get projects as well now from interior designers. And, and as our as our practice has grown, we, we now get projects through other means like Instagram. Uh, but in those days, particularly, it was basically a project, uh, our clients we previously had, contractors, plus, of course, being in that community, uh, you know, word of mouth went around relatively easy. People would actually come in Laguna Beach to the design review process and just listen. And that would be part of how they would potentially select their architect or designer uh, so, so just being up there and having those presentations and being successful and getting has approved, and I'd get tapped on the shoulder every now and then afterwards, and people would say, "Hey, I've got a project. Would you come talk to me?" So that really helped. And how was the economy at that time? It was a good time to start. I mean, we had a little shaky time in two thousand and one, obviously, but once we passed two thousand and one, we had a good run up till two thousand and eight. So it was a great time to be building a firm and expanding. And so by the time we got to the, the Great Recession, we we had enough of a reputation that we could keep going just about through that. <laughs> Looking back, what were the key or pivotal moments that you see in your practice? There are a couple. I, I think just, like I said, the, the first phase was all about the, the public hearings and design review and Laguna Beach. That's what built our initial practice. But then there was a pivot. We had a client who wanted us to do a home in Los Angeles. And um, we started that home in around 2005 and finished it in 2008, right around when the economy was failing. 
and he unfortunately had to sell that house. But it sold despite the economy failing, and uh, it sold for a lot of money for probably what was a record price at that stage in that part of Los Angeles. So that makes people take notice, and it was it was interesting how that led to new projects in greater Los Angeles rather than just coastal Orange County. So we started realizing that we could drive up to LA and do more projects as opposed to sitting all night at design review. And, you know, that process was beginning to get a lot more difficult around then. So we found ourselves in a situation where it was getting harder and harder to get projects approved locally. Felt like we were banging our head against the wall there. So we started banging our head against the steering wheel instead. <laughs> and uh, the good thing about going to LA is you do get home eventually. <laughs> so, and what was the key to be able to get that work, more body of work from Los Angeles as opposed to where you were previously working? Well, it was our first house set it out, which is the house on, or set it off, which is the house on Blue Jay Way, which is which is in our book. But we, we, we did that, as I said, finished it in 2008, remodeled it again for a different client later. Um, but I think the exposure that the house generated and the, the fact that it, it sold for a lot of money, to be honest, helped. It helped move us in a direction where we found ourselves, as the recession was starting to uh, ease, doing speculative projects in Los Angeles. And some of those were with new clients and some of those were with existing clients we've done projects with before. So as our client base continue to expand, you know, you'd be amazed where that leads. And, you know, we've been lucky, I would say through the middle part of our firm history, we were doing 15 to 60% of our projects as development rather than homeowners, which is interesting because we started off with just homeowners, moved through that phase, and then we're back to just basically homeowners right now. Got it. And so you don't do a whole lot of speculative projects anymore. Are there speculative projects still happening? There's less than there was. I think there's a, a, a market saturation problem right now, and uh, I'm sure they they will come back again. But you know, it's it's a cycle, and I'm old enough to see the cycle a few times. And it's really like when when a recession happens and price pressure eases, and land becomes uh, more affordable, interest rates go down, development opportunities make sense as the cycle moves forward. Product starts to sell, then people get excited. A lot of other people. People start doing it. Suddenly, there is too much product on the market. Suddenly, people are asking too much for land, and then it stalls and it cycles. And it does this every seven years on average. <laughs> so we're in the non-development cycle. I feel right now. Got it. Got it. Now, you mentioned that it was a key pivot moment when you moved from Orange County and started doing more work in Los Angeles. You said there were a couple others. What are the other pivot points? Looking back at the practice. Well, I, I think that was the, the main one. And then once we had got three or four projects built in Los Angeles, things really took off in the, in that part of the world. And because it's such a much larger market and there's much larger potential projects and so on, then your exposure grows. And then that left, held us in the last, I would say, three to four years, we pivoted to projects outside of the region. So, uh, and that's where, that's really interesting because that's based on, um, uh, publication and particularly, you know, internet publication like Instagram. And Instagram is something we've only been on for two or three years, but we've already picked up projects abroad based on that and people just looking at images online and then contacting us. So we're doing a project right now in Thailand that came through that and we're doing a project in England came through a similar way. Fascinating. Now, when, when you look at the challenge, the, let's look at the business side for a minute here. What are the, some of the key business lessons that you've learned as you've built your practice? Wow, that's a great question, you know. Um, I think one of the most important things is just is actually how important communication is. And I think architects are often are not very good at it, and we're not really trained to do that. I mean, but we have to rethink that because, in a way, everything that we do is communication, and we can get sucked into the idea that you know what we're drawing is a, a beautiful rendering or something but in reality it's a way of communicating an idea of what you want to build so um, that's been like a key lesson how important communication is and how well, how important it is to be upfront I think another lesson that was very important to me that I, I see saw before I worked in my own firm that I took into my own firm was that it's super important to be as upfront as possible about how much things are going to cost 
and and it, even to the point where you don't get the job you know because i think people have very unrealistic expectations sometimes about how complicated and expensive it is to do a custom home and when i talk to somebody who you know calls our office about a new project uh, i try and anticipate what i think it's going to cost to build their home based on where when they build it as opposed to even what's happening right now because the the pricing that we're seeing in our current project is not the pricing that will be happening two years from now. And if they don't have the right budget in mind, the project is going to be very difficult and stressful for everybody from the beginning. And we often say to people, look, it's it's not that you can't build a house for the price that you're thinking. It's just that you can't build a house like what you're looking at on our website or in our book. That's a certain type of house. So if you're attracted to that, you need to be in this budget range. And, um, you know, a lot of the sites that we work on are complicated and difficult and hillside. So there's sometimes a tremendous amount of cost, even before you get to the point where you're actually putting, you know, sticks up. When you're in this conversation with a potential client about moving ahead, are you in a competitive situation where they're comparing you against other architects? Uh, not always, but often. I would say at least 50% of the time. So the one great thing for us at this stage in our in our practice is that you know we've got enough work out there that we we are not really dealing with people who don't like our work or our people who come to us want to do homes like we do which is really nice so we're not competing against other architects who have different styles they're coming for that usually it just comes down to availability and 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 cost i guess and you know we're probably there's a few architects that work in the communities that we work in and uh, people would you know, probably some people will will talk to nearly all of them. Um, When we do projects that are not local, people are really specifically coming to us and asking us to do a project in a different place. Like we've we've got a project right now, for example, in Sacramento. And so they came looking for us. So the conversation is a little bit different there. Uh, The same with a project we're doing in in Canada, uh, just outside Vancouver, a similar type of scenario there. And what is your approach to marketing? Well, I don't really market, but we Instagram. <laughs> That's it. Um, I, I think that um, we, we started Instagram because we, we realized that obviously it's a very visual medium. And uh, what we do is visual. Uh, but we noticed that it's a great way to, to stay in touch with our clients, that there, a lot of our clients were on Instagram. We noticed and we thought, well, you know, if we post something every now and then, we'll just you know, remind us that, that, that remind them that we're here. And it's really interesting. That's probably one of those other lessons that you, know, you need to continue to be available, I guess. Uh, it, it's, you shouldn't presume that just because you did a job with someone that they, you know, they'll remember. I mean, especially, obviously, if they're going to, to do a new home, they will come back. But often it might be that they're out to dinner with somebody and they're just busy and talking and that person says, oh, I'd love to you know, do a house or something and they just may forget. And, uh, you know, you want to just be on their radar. So, and a lot of time people use Instagram because it's passive. So they might be sitting in an airport or have 10 minutes at home in the evening. I just look at nice pictures because it's pleasant and you don't have to interact. So we wanted our pictures to appear there and remind people that, hey, we're here. <laughs> so, and it's really interesting and uh, how connections come together that way. And I'm continually surprised by that. And it happens, I, I notice ourselves, like I, I bumped into a contractor, you know, at a party a while ago and I was like, God, I'd forgotten that guy does really good houses because he's just, I just haven't done anything with him for six years. And just meeting him there reminded me, yeah, the next time we're working in that neighborhood, I, we should call him as well and have him come and take a look at the project. And I bumped into clients at different events that I haven't seen for years and and they'd be like, oh, yeah, but my friend, you know, you know, he's thinking of doing this. Would you be, would you be interested? And I'm like, yeah, of course. But you know, if you haven't had that uh, conversation at that time. So it's like the point of this part of the conversation is you need to be present. You need to be at the front of people's, you know, cranium that you're there and you're available and find ways to do that to remind people you're out there. How many full time staff do you have right now? We have eight full time staff. And when you went from working alone, what was the challenge behind getting to that level of a team of eight people? What would you say would be the most challenging thing about that for you? Well, I think 
it's interesting there are almost like different levels of practice like when i started i was was on my own for probably six months before i realized i needed somebody to help me and in some ways looking back those were that was a really fun six months it seemed there was not a lot of pressure and obviously the more staff you have the more work you need to generate and you know in that way it can lead to some more pressure but if you want to achieve certain things you need to be at different levels so we were just two people for quite a while. Then we were four people. Then we were eight people. Um, but I think that somewhere between eight, 10, 12, somewhere that we have a couple of part-time people that help us as well is for me feels ideal because the, the business that I'm particularly in, it, it's very custom and my clients do want to see me and have me be part of that process. And so there's a limit to how many projects that I can realistically be comfortably involved in and I think at this level I can stay involved in all our projects but if we grew to say 24 or 30 people um, it just wouldn't be possible anymore and while that might work for other types of architecture or commercial projects and so on uh, we'd lose that personal connection which is what a lot of our clients is as important to them as a design so like we said earlier I mean people aren't coming to us because they don't know what work we do. They know what work we do. So they like the work. Then the next question they have is, you know, well, do I like the people there? And so do I, am I willing to spend three to four years of my life with those people? And uh, one of my clients put it very succinctly once where he said, I never want to work with anyone in any capacity that I'm doing that's not someone I'd be comfortable going out to dinner with and spending an evening with. And so I think that's something that a lot of our clients expect, that level of personal interaction. And also the type of work we do, because it's their homes, it is very personal. And there's a lot of very personal questions you have to ask. You're trying to figure out how to make this home work for them as best it can. So you need to figure out how their life works and, you know, sleeping habits and bathroom habits and things like that. Those questions get asked. So it's important that they feel comfortable and confident about that. And um, that's part of that personal sharing process, I think. So for me, this is a good size. And I think that's probably where we're going to stay. What what fees are you charging right now for your projects? Tell me about that. Fees are all over the place, and they they really are depend on the client and depend on on the project. I mean, obviously, uh, we would love to get as much money as possible, but we don't necessarily always use that as a, in our selection process. I and mean, sometimes we are selecting our clients, sometimes our clients are selecting us. But we're trying to balance our work. We're trying to do different types and scales of, of homes. Um, one thing that we do do, though, is we generally work on a fixed fee. And uh, we are not big into additional services. So sometimes it's interesting when you're doing homes and you're doing it on a fixed fee. I and mean, sometimes you do one design and the client's blissfully happy and it's like you feel like you made out like a bandit um, but then other clients we go through a lot of iterations and but we still stick to that fee principle fixed fee principle and there's several reasons for that but two of the most important are that when you look at relationships that break down there's usually a money component and then not knowing what that money component is up front is usually a big part of why these relationships break down um, so for me it was always important that you know, if, okay, if we if we don't have a project that's profitable, hopefully we learn. And the next time we have a similar project, we try and assess the client, we try and charge more so it will be profitable. Uh, the other issue, though, is that you know, for our clients, mostly they do this once. The type of projects we do, they do this only this once in their lives, most of them. And it's probably the biggest financial decision they're ever going to make. And it's, you know, it's fraught with concern there and, and worry. And, um, you know, for them... It's really important that we're on their side. So having that conversation up front, agreeing on a price and then sticking with it keeps you in the client's camp. And that that's really important. So having them feel like you're you're with them, you're on the side, you have no in, in incentive to make the house bigger and make it cost more because you're acting on a percentage basis. I mean, I've heard stories from people about architects who've you know, agreed on a budget and a percentage, and then they design a house that's much more expensive. The client's in shock because they're like, oh my God, I've got to find all this extra money. And they get a bill from the architect like, oh, by the way, now you owe me more money 
you know, because you design, I mean, I don't see how that business model works, so how people would ever come back to you. So I recommend you. So that's, as we, we depend on referrals. So we want our clients to have a good experience. We want them to, uh, you know, come out of this having a positive opinion of us and share positive stories with people. And it is a risk because sometimes, like you said, some projects I'm like, wow, and I'm sure we made, didn't even make minimum wage on that one. But, you know, money, it's not all about money. It's about the designs we do and, and the projects we do and the portfolio we're building. And um, that's our key. That's what, you know, as long as we can pay the bills and cash flow works, <laughs> we're good enough with that. How do you determine your fees, Paul? Usually by, by trying to examine how, how, in a way, it's time and money in the end for everything. So in our business, it's really time. Um, how much time is the project going to take? How complicated is it going to be? How complicated is the reviewing process? So if we know we're going to work in a city with uh, a complicated public uh, approval process, we'll charge more. And that's one place where we will limit. Uh, we'll limit our fees so that you know we don't want to be going through seven or eight rounds of public you know, disclosure and approval and then have to redesign the house each time. And obviously that wouldn't work. Um, but we also feel that we have to at least include enough of those hearings because, you know, our clients hiring us based on our experience and they expect us to design something that's approvable. And so that's a, a, a balance issue. And then there's just a, the time involved, how complicated the project is. That's another issue. And, and lastly, it's like, where's the location? And, you know, what does this project have for us in terms of our portfolio? Are we, is it, you know, it's a lot of projects. We, we love all our clients and we love all our projects, but some projects maybe lead down paths which might lead us in different directions or different communities. And so we might be a little more aggressive on those to, to, to get those projects in the door. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So just in terms of order of magnitude, can you give me an idea and our audience here an idea of a, a kind of a typical house? I know the fees will be all over the range depending on the condition, depending on the approval process, but generally what would we be looking at here? Well, it, it, it's, it's a tough question to answer and I, I am being a little bit evasive because um, it's... Uh, it's not something I feel like that we share, we definitely don't share with other clients what we're charging. So um, obviously the smaller the home, it tends to be more relatively. The larger the home, it tends to be less because the, the sad truth is if you're designing a 2,000 square foot house or a 20,000 square foot house, the process is essentially the same. It's just a little bit more time. Um, but uh, the process is similar and you go through the same phases. But um, I do know that it's uh, easier to think about. Like I said, when I talk to my clients, I generally don't even talk about our costs up front. I focus on how much the cost of the house is going to be. And right now, we're seeing homes in the hillsides of Orange County and Los Angeles running at $1,200 a foot or something. So um, that's just right now at this moment, a typical cost that you'll see for a high-end home that like the type that we design. So that's the big number. That's a big question. If you're going to design a 10,000 square foot house, you're looking at 10 to $12 million right now. So that's what they need to be focused on. Yeah. And that 1200, that includes the soft costs? Yes, depending on the situation. But yeah, that's, that's where we start. Yeah. I mean, and we'll, that's what we try and tell people. Look, if you have that type of budget in mind, 10, 20% one way or the other, you're going to get a beautiful house. And it's the nice thing is if you can start a project like that, then you're not constantly talking about budgets through the project because the reality is whatever we all dream up to put on that piece of land, it's probably going to fit in that budget um, roughly. There may be some cost savings that need to be done or some compromise and nobody gets everything at any budget level. You know, But having said that, there are projects in our office that are you know, we started a few years back on simpler lots that are, you know, costing 50, 60% of that number. And there are other projects that are costing twice that. Got it. And I understand you're declining to answer a specific number in terms of the fees. That makes sense. Uh, what, what I'd like <laughs> to, um, you know, when you, when obviously there's, these are going to be very large numbers working with these kind of houses on these kind of properties. And I know the time it takes to develop this kind of product. When you're having that conversation, you did mention, look, we focus on the overall cost of the project as opposed to focusing just on what the architect's going to make or the soft costs or anything like that. Does the, the conversation ever happen when you plop down that number uh, that includes your fee and they're looking at that and they're like, wow, that's a lot of money? Do you ever have to have that discussion where you're having a conversation with them about the value of the architecture fees? Or do you find with your market that 
look, they're focused on the house and the fees of whatever it takes to get done, they're happy with that. There is always a discussion about money and uh, and our fees. There always is. I, I don't think we've had hardly any clients ever have just said fine. <laughs> you know? So, um, and uh, but I think that one thing that's been we've been able to use in terms of marketing is that the homes that we've done have been for sale have all set very high price points. So you can say that we at least think we're contributing to that value there. But um, generally it's really about that overall cost. Um, and so we will, we will start that discussion with people and make sure that they're comfortable, that they, they have the budget and then we can start to break it down for them. And, um, and then our fee is always something that we talk about with them. Um, but I, I think that not all homes are that expensive, but again, it's, it's like for us, it's important. We're, we're building a portfolio of projects and we know what we like to do. We know what we have experience in doing. And so when people come to us, if someone calls up our office and says, you know, well, I only have a budget of $500 a foot and I'm looking at the site and it's comparable to all our other sites, I can go, well, it, one of the nice things about having built so many homes is we can say, well, you know, the house we did on that street, two, to, you know, two streets over cost this amount of money and this is why. And so if they're still like, well, I think I can build it for a lot less money. And then I'm like, well, we're probably not the right fit, you know, and it's not that we want to, we're not trying to spend people's money. I think we've, discovered over the years that no matter how wealthy our clients are, that everyone is concerned about making sure they're getting value for money and that the process is being fair to them. But I don't want to be in a situation with people who have let their dreams in a way uh, govern their pocketbook um, without just talking about money. But, you know, it's like if you decide you want to build a home, it's it's a tremendously stressful experience for a lot of people. We, we want to try and make that process as stress-free as, as we can. And it should be a very positive thing. It should be a process that you maybe are, as we said, you're often just doing it once in your life, but it should be a great experience. It should be a tremendously creative act. And if every single thing that we draw, talk about is, is, you know, continually discussed about, well, how much is this costing and so on. And that's, that's just going to make that process unpleasant for the client as well as ourselves. So, and if, if the money isn't there to do it the way they want it, there's a series of disappointments you're setting up. And that's why I think it's really important to get realism into the process. So you look at in some ways our homes and they're kind of, there's a fantasy component to them, but it's based on a, a heavy dose of realism about what's feasible. Paul, what is your primary challenge right now as a practice owner? Well, I think even even despite all these homes that we do, it's always a balance trying to make sure the biggest challenge is always balancing work coming in, work going out. You know, um, like you can find yourself like having a tremendously busy design phase, and then suddenly you've got. 10, 15 projects under construction and you're busy all the time helping to get those projects to completion. And there's, you know, it's, as we often say, it's a two dimensional process to develop a three dimensional product. So you, you find there's always things that people don't perceive until the house starts to go up and problems to be solved. So we're, we're always on site trying to help move this process along. So that's probably always the biggest challenge is just getting that balance right between, you know, having enough work coming in, having enough work coming out and not finding yourself in a situation where you've been tremendously busy and then suddenly we wake up one day and there's no more work because <laughs> we just finished all those homes but we forgot to look for new things. So it can be, you know, a challenge to pull that together. But I, I think uh, just continually trying to, you know, we're trying to do good work. We're trying to improve. We're trying to make the next house better than the last house and try and continue to learn. And so we spend a lot of time as well with our contractors on site, trying to figure out how to build things better. And one thing that I always feel personally, that's important that, uh, you know, you know, you're an architect, so you know, certain things, but you don't know everything. You certainly don't know how to build a lot of things, um, but you have a concept. So again, going back to that initial point of that communication, like my goal is to I go on site and I talk to people on site and I don't tell them how to build things. I tell them what we're trying to achieve. And then I ask them, how would they do that? And then we assess that and we talk about it and we figure it out. So it's, it's not me saying how to waterproof a detail or me how to 
put a rally in place of like, this is what I want it to look like when it's finished. Is this possible? Can we make this happen? And obviously, we're trying to make our ideas new and creative. So that can be very exciting for everyone. And I want everyone to feel included in that. And that it's, a, it's definitely a team effort. That's one thing that I, I think we, we just always have to remember. It's, it's a huge team. And it's not me or even just my office. It's like everybody involved and everyone's ideas are important. And our goal is to kind of stir the ship of this project and keep it going in the right direction and not necessarily get it like going off course. But it's not our job to make sure that it's done exactly. It's not our ideas only. If you could give one piece of advice, Paul, to residential designers, residential architects who'd like to up-level the caliber, the size, the budget of the projects they're working on, what would you tell them? Gosh, I mean, it's a really, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, part of the problem or the idea we've been, I've been very lucky in terms of over the years that I have managed to meet people that have enabled us and have been supported by so many clients who have you know, cheerleaded behind us and pushed us on and came to us with bigger projects. Um, you know, it's good. I, I think some of the key players along that way uh, were people that we did repeat projects with. So people who we started with one project and they brought us into another project that maybe grew in scale and so on. So you got to, it's like President Clinton used to say, 90% of things are just showing up. You know, you've got to be there and grab opportunities. I mean, as they come along um, that, you know, if a client is, you're doing a house for clients locally and they're just talking about that they have, you know, they're, they're thinking about buying in a resort or they're thinking about doing a weekend house somewhere or their friend is just go like, Hey, I can help with that. You know, just be, be forthright there with, without being obviously arrogant, but you know, just like maybe I can take a look at that. Maybe I can help with that. Um, and try and, and be, you know, humble about things. And it's the, hopefully the work speaks for itself. So you don't have to, get out there and start overselling things. But, you know, sometimes things grow out of strange places, you know, or, or, you know, we had also people that decide to work with other people. We've had a few different scenarios where people have talked to us and work with someone else, but then they might call back to the question and we, we try and help them. We try and help everyone that we get involved with as much as possible. And you'd be surprised where that goes. Sometimes we suddenly find ourselves back on that job we didn't get. <laughs> so for different reasons. So I just think being open, being out there, uh, trying to, you know, use what you have and try and think about if you have a goal that you want to do bigger homes, then try and find ways to, to, you know, get those images that you have out there and ideas out there. Um, and try and get yourself exposed publicly, I guess, is the key that, I mean, that's how really I built our firm is by, doing public hearings, being present. And there's a lot of things you can do out there that can ex- improve your exposure if, if you, you want to. There, there, you, know, you can join the AIA, you can participate in uh, different committees, you can sign up for a local review board, you know, things to just get yourself out there that people can see you, like we said earlier, and know that you're there. Now, when, when people are referring you, when you're looking at this this concept of getting repeat business and, uh, you know, having people uh, refer you, what, what do you find is the key? Do you do anything to stay in touch with them over time? Or do you find that they remember who you are and they send work your way? I hope they remember who we are, <laughs> especially if they're living in one of our houses. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, we do. Uh, we don't particularly, but I think we've been very fortunate. We're, we're getting a lot of press and you know we we are books out there and people get excited and and it's one of the nice things about doing uh personal homes is that you know like we said a lot of discussion is not uh, it's not about cost and money um once you pass those points um i think if you were for example a commercial architect and you did you know kind of traditional track houses or you did uh, typical commercial buildings, you know, clients may come along and say, yeah, that was a nice experience for Paul's office, but like, let's try and find someone who can do something different. Let's try and find something, uh, you know, that's less expensive or somebody less expensive. So th- th- we're, our situation is a little bit different than that. So we have our clients living hopefully in our homes and, you know, they're there every day and they, they sometimes send us little notes and stuff and, you know, the things they like about it and they tell their friends and I love this detail and so on. So, so it's really, uh, from my perspective, we're lucky that way. 
Paul, you mentioned getting out there. Do you keep any sort of social calendar? You're talking about getting out there socially outside of work or have all these connections happen just through the course of doing the work and building your practice? For me personally, it's been through the course of work, which is great you know so i can take a break from that at the weekends but um you know right now we work with a a pr firm and uh, that's been very helpful um and obviously it's uh interesting if i i've noticed that if i if i wanted to work in a new market or we had to go um there's an architect friend of mine who is based in another city who's trying to establish themselves in los angeles and they hired a pr firm to just get them to places and you know that's an active way if you have the budget for it that uh, you can use but it's 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 a hard i think it's very hard for young firms and because it's expensive and you know the reality is that it's not a direct like you pay this money and you get this result it's like accumulation over time of exposure to different people and uh, it's it's very rare that you will get a direct result like you know the pr person gave the book to somebody and then that somebody called you and you got a job it doesn't work like that so it's a hard cost to justify i think when a firm is getting established but i think you can try and replicate that yourself like i said and and uh, use as many avenues that are like you're exposed to so i mean i can imagine a scenario for example for a young architect like if they joined a golf club you know they played golf and they met people then they might meet potential clients so you have to and one of the things we were we were lucky to be in, a, as you said at the beginning, an affluent community where people had the resources to build, you know, custom homes. If you want to be in the custom home business, you don't build custom homes in most cities. You know, it's it's got it's only in places where the budgets exist and the land is unique enough or the community is unique enough that people need to hire. So you need to find find a way to get yourself into the place where the work is. And I think that would apply to all types of. Uh, architecture and so on that you know whatever type you want to do figure out how you get exposed to people who make decisions who hire you excellent paul thank you for joining us today on the business of architecture thank you so much thanks for having me i really appreciate it and that's a wrap if you haven't already make sure you get access to my free video course that reveals the roadmap to building a practice that is dependable rewarding delivers an exceptional experience for you, your staff, and clients, is autonomous, meaning that it can run without your constant input, and last but not least, has a powerful mission and purpose. Go to dreampracticewebinar.com to access this free video course. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.